from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning and welcome to the Library of Congress. We're so pleased to have you here for this special National Ambassador Ceremony. My name is John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, the library's reading promotion arm. And I want to especially to welcome not only our visitors uh, from HarperCollins and from the public, but also in particular our special student visitors from the Capitol Hill Day School and Cesar Chavez Public Charter Schools. Welcome to everyone. Could you wave your hands? Okay. This, after all, is a program uh, about the importance of reading and the importance of young people, and we simply could not have such a ceremony without direct involvement of, of the young people. Uh, the Center for the Book, also in the Library of Congress, uh, administers the uh, new, relatively new, Young Readers Center, which is here in this glorious Jefferson building. For those who've not been to the Library of Congress, this was our first separate building. The first Library of Congress was in the Capitol. Uh, in the Capitol, the ambitious Librarian of Congress centralized copyright, which meant free materials came pouring into the Capitol, and a new building was needed, and by the time this building was started in 1886, America was feel, feeling its muscle, and this building got bigger and more glorious and bigger and more glorious, and by the time it opened in 1897, you see the magnificence of the art and architecture, especially if you came in through the Great Hall. So it's a wonderful setting uh, to celebrate books and reading, and we're pleased to have as the Center for the Books partner in the National Ambassador Program, uh, the Children's Book Council. Uh, the Center for the Book has affiliates in all of the states, but also some very important nonprofit partners of over 80 organizations to join us in promoting books and reading. And the National Ambassador Program is a special project uh, with the Children's Book Council. And the Children's Book Council not only is one of our 80 partners, but it is the nonprofit trade association of publishers of trade books for kids, children, and young adults. And it's a natural partnership, and we're pleased that they can be here, and I would like to uh, introduce its executive director, Robin Adelson, and thank her for her efforts in bringing us together. Robin, we'd like you to say a few words. I come with props. I always come with props. Um, you know, five years ago, I reached out to John Cole, and we together decided it was time to turn this community of readers into a community of young readers with a leader. And it has been a phenomenal partnership. And I think at the time, we felt Children's Book Council and our Literacy Foundation, Every Child a Reader, and the Center for the Book and the Library of Congress were partners that were meant to be. I think what we didn't quite realize at the time was how many more partners were going to come into the fold with us and build this fabulous program. Um, it truly is a program for a community of readers. And this community and this program would not be the same without our financial supporters, um, cheerleaders as well, but it's the financial part that we are tremendously, tremendously grateful for, to Penguin Young Readers Group, Scholastic Inc., HarperCollins Children's Books, Random House Children's Books, and Candlewick Press, as well as a grant that we received over the last two years from the Lois Lenski Covey Foundation that enables us to send our ambassador to a school that wins a school visit from the ambassador every year. Um, a true, valuable, and without whom I don't know where we'd be partner is Goodman Media, um, helmed in, in our experience by Virginia Anagnos, who has been the most unbelievable publicist 
and without whom people would not be hearing about a program. And as you all know, you can have a fabulous idea, but if people don't hear about it, it only gets you so far. So Virginia, hats off to you. We wouldn't be here without you. Our other building partners were partners that we really thought were the people that we were honoring, but turned out to be so much more than that. John, Catherine, and now Walter. Who knew that the first ambassadors were going to become the essential builders of the program itself? I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> but maybe it was implicit in the choice of the word ambassador for this post. Um, some of you know, some of you who were involved way back when, in the early, early formation of this program, I really wanted it to be called a laureate. And the determination was ultimately that this is an ambassadorial role, not a laureate. Catherine recently noted in an interview that there is a difference between a laureate and an ambassador. And the truth is, as much as we hope the people we select consider this role to be an honor, and we intend for it to be an honor. As Catherine knows, as John knows, and as Walter is quickly finding out, they don't rest upon their laurels. <laughs> These people work. They work hard. Our ambassadors work hard to spread their message, to share their platform, to raise awareness of the books that are available, and to connect those books with the kids that they're writing for. In so doing, our ambassadors develop a keen sense of what is needed, and how they can use this post to achieve the most. And they tell us what we can do to help them, and I hope they'll never stop doing that. So Walter, we're here for you. Know that, to protect you. <laughs> we serve at the pleasure of the ambassador, and it is truly a great, great honor. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that, that there is a tremendous selection committee that is convened each year to select, to, to help the Librarian of Congress, in fact, select the, li the Library of Congress appointed National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. We are so lucky today that members of all three selection committees are here with us. From the very first committee, we have Maria Salvador and Jewel Stoddard. They selected John Cheska. From the second selection committee, we have John Sheska. It's <laughs> good, right? And from this most recent selection committee, we are thrilled to have Jenny Brown and Caroline Ward with us. Thank you. Oh my God, and Katherine Patterson. <laughs> See, it never, never occurs to me how much work we have you doing. <laughs> terrible, terrible thing. So let me just tell you a little bit briefly about each of our ambassadors and, and why they were selected and what it is they've been saying. And then I will pass it over to them because they say it way better than I do. John Sheska, the country now knows how to pronounce the name Sheska. <laughs> they don't necessarily know how to spell it, but they can pronounce it. Um, and the cookies that were in John's name the first go round spelled his name properly. The same company spelled Catherine Patterson with one T properly, and this year you'll see spelled Walter Dean Myers properly. So we're on a roll, partners all over the place. John, John was our nation's first ambassador and has been so tremendously helpful in creating this program, in reaching out to kids, in making you laugh hysterically and making the rest of us laugh hysterically, and at the core, respecting and appreciating the written word and what books and reading can do for all of us. Um, John is such a great example of what this post is all about, what this program is all about, and the fact that once you are an ambassador once, you are an ambassador forever and ever and ever. Um, keep dusting off that medal. <laughs> we'll keep bringing you back. John's platform was reaching reluctant readers, and he did, and he continues to do so, and he will, God bless him, continue to do so for a great long time, many years to come, and we are so thrilled to have had this chance to work with him and to let more people know who he is and what he stands for, and so thank you. <laughs> Catherine Patterson. 
brought elegance and this tremendous honesty to her role. Catherine's platform has been Read for Your Life, and she wants you to read for your life as a community and to be active participants in your community and to learn more about the world around you and to participate in it actively. Um, Catherine so easily inspires everybody who comes into contact with her, and it has been such a joy and such a pleasure and such a tremendous honor. Um, we will continue to work with you. However, it is my promise that I will not be calling you regularly to tell you to wear your medal. <laughs> Catherine is not a big fan of the very heavy metal. I personally think she likes when it beeps when she goes through airport security. It's a little extra attention. It's not a bad thing. And then there's Walter. Walter now comes to us, his platform, and he will hopefully tell you lots more about it, is reading is not optional. What a critical time to be hearing a platform like this, and what a valuable platform, and what a far-reaching and wide-reaching platform, and who better to espouse it. Walter writes for everyone. He writes for kids of all ages. He writes for kids of all backgrounds. His stories are honest, and his stories are hard-hitting, and his stories are meaningful. And like his predecessors, he has this tremendous respect for his young readers, and he is inspired by them. I was struck upon meeting him for the first time, having a real conversation not too long ago, about his excitement, his palpable excitement when he talks about how important reading is for children, and when he talks about kids that he's worked with and helped read and helped write. Um, what an amazing person, and what a great chance this is for all of us. Walter is our new superhero for children's books, and we could not be more delighted. So I will tell you that when John became National Ambassador, he got a super cape. When Catherine became National Ambassador, she got a magic wand. And you have not been forgotten, because as I said, I come with props. I do believe you said in an interview that you imagined the ceremony would involve a sword. You Dana on one knee. I know this life. Uh, it's yours. Use your power for good. And know that you can call on us anytime. We are your cheerleaders. We are your assistants. We are here for you. We are so excited, so delighted to have the three of you here together. And your greatest building blocks, I suspect, to have Jerry, to have John, and to have Connie here. Thank you so much for being a part of this and for letting our ambassadors do their work. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. She's not only introduced the program, she's given us a preliminary look at the ambassadors. I must say one other added benefit for both the Library of Congress and all of us is that the ambassadors have a couple of duties each year. One is to launch Children's Book Week in New York, but a second is to come to the National Book Festival, which the Library of Congress sponsors every fall. And having been working on the book festival since the beginning. I'm a great, feel great knowing we're going to have these ambassadors as certain things, certain wonderful speakers at the book festival each year. Uh, the first one is John Cheska. John is going to give us a few words as of uh, what it was like to be the first ambassador, and I'm sure he will not spare. Are, he, are you going to nail me on that helicopter thing, John? I thought so. John Cheska. Thank you, John. Um, I just briefly wanted to welcome Walter to the team. This is so exciting, because now we are like all the superheroes. And it's like the Justice League of Ambassador America in children's books. But that would be a long acronym, so we're not going to call it that. We'll just be the superheroes. Um, and I also wanted to just tell Catherine, now is the time you have to turn over the keys, Catherine, to the Ambassador Lamborghini, <laughs> the Ambassador Helicopter, which John said he's still working on, and the Ambassador Jetpack. 
So the throttle button sticks a little, Walter. When you come down into schools with it, watch out for that, because that's what happens. And I also wanted to explain maybe just a little bit um, about a quote when I was being interviewed a couple days ago. They asked me about Walter. And I don't know, I just said, oh, he's like a combination of Darth Vader and Pat the Bunny. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I was going to explain it, but I, I can't. So I'm just going to leave you with that and say, Walter, welcome to the ambassadorship. And we're here to help you. Love you. Thanks, guys. For a good part of his two-year ambassadorship, uh, John felt that the appropriate way that he should be traveling would be a helicopter, a big helicopter, and he looked for it to be landing somewhere on the Madison building where we did some of the events. And so we did have a helicopter event, and was he surprised when I pulled a toy helicopter out of my pocket <laughs> and uh, presented it to him, and his jaw dropped, and he said, I'm going to remember this. And he has, but uh, there are more gifts coming, and we're just pleased that uh, he was, gave us such a wonderful launch. Uh, Catherine Patterson, as Robin said, was a special ambassador for us. I just went to the Louisiana Book Festival with the Louisiana Center for the Book and Baton Rouge with Catherine and with John, her husband, and we had a wonderful time, and I'm very pleased to call on Catherine for a few words about the ambassadorship and her feelings about it. Katherine Patterson. I don't think that there's any doubt that uh, John and I are quite different. He can, <laughs> he can leap up the stage. I have to come around to the steps. Uh, I think probably Walter can leap, but there are steps, Walter. <laughs> uh, uh, I love being an ambassador. <laughs> uh, and I must say, Walter, I think both John and I feel a pang on the day that we turn over the role. Uh, I, I, somebody was bringing us up here from the Library of Congress, and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm the dying ambassador. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Robin said I couldn't say that, so I will just, just uh, erase that from the, from the tape. Uh, and I do want to thank uh, the committee that, that uh, nominated me and Dr. Billington for uh, agreeing and uh, the wonderful uh, Center for the Book, John Cole and all of his wonderful staff and, and uh, Robin and her changing cast of, of beautiful and very capable uh, young women who've made these last two years just a joy. And, and it's been wonderful for me. Uh, I was just was going to tell you about uh, one event uh, near the end of my two years. I was standing on the stage next to uh, a young veteran of Afghanistan who is about Walter's height. Uh, I said he was 6'7", but he, he claims he's only 6'5", or so. Uh, how tall are you, Walter? Six. <laughs> yeah, well, they look, they're big, they're big. Uh, John and I will be standing in his shadow forever. But uh, I was on the stage with, with Trent Reedy, and he said to this uh, group of, of about 400 uh, middle grade, middle uh, school students, Bridge to Terabithia changed, uh, saved my life. And they did a double take. And then he went on to tell them how in the middle of the Afghan desert when he didn't know if every day was going to be his last. He received a copy of a children's book and he began to see beauty and the ugliness of war and it changed his life. And he came back and wrote about uh, the ugliness and the beauty. Uh, standing next to Trent as he made this plea to these students, he said, I just wanted to tell you, I just wanted you to realize how important reading is, how a book can save your life. And I was standing on the stage next to Trent as he made this plea, and I was as moved by the audience. I'd been going around urging 
young and old to read for your life. And it was Trent who was delivering my message more eloquently than I possibly could. Of course, I was thrilled when I was asked if I would consider being the new ambassador for young people's literature. But I had some misgivings. I, I know John Shuska fairly well. I've sat in audiences and fell off the chair laughing at him. And everybody always talks about how much they laugh when John speaks. And then people will come up to me timidly afterwards and tell me how much they cried. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, you're not going to cry today. It's OK. Uh, besides, I, th I thought about two years in advance and realized that by the end of two 2011, I would be 79 years old. And I thought, my word, will I even live that long? But apparently, I have. <laughs> so looking back, I have to ask myself if I've accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish. And I have to say no. I wanted to turn the world upside down. I wanted the love of literature to spread like a contagion throughout the country. I wanted every taxpayer to demand taxes high enough to keep every public library open, fully staffed at least eight hours every day. <clears throat> I wanted every school to have a fully accredited librarian who would know books and children so well that she could match the, or he could match the perfect book to each child. And I wanted him or her to have a budget big enough to be able to do that. Uh, so no, I haven't completed my mission. But as uh, Robin quoted me <laughs> earlier, I realized that an ambassador has a mission uh, a laureate, uh, not rest on her, laureate, uh, her laurels, but a mass, uh, an ambassador has a job to do. And that's why I'm so thrilled that we have another tall veteran with us today. Uh, I looked at the list of, of Walter's works, and I think most of us writers would feel like a slouch uh, looking at all that Walter has accomplished in poetry and in uh, nonfiction and in fiction for every age. But even more than that, Walter's the man who can speak in the language of those young people who value literature least, but who need it most. And so it's with joy and anticipation that I turn this unfinished mission over to you, Walter. And now I would like to uh, introduce the Librarian of Congress, uh, Dr. James Billington, the person who appoints our national ambassador. Uh, Dr. Billington is the 13th Librarian of Congress, and this year marks his 25th year in the position. He was appointed in 1987 by President Reagan and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Dr. Billington's vision is responsible for making the vast riches of our institution, over 150 million items, a true multimedia encyclopedia. He's worked hard to not only build and make these resources available, but to help develop the library's extraordinary website and really developing programs such as the National Film Registry and the National Recorded Sound Registry, which recognize contributions in these particular fields, while at the same time drawing urgent attention to outstanding contributions uh, in that field. We're doing the same today in many ways for young people's literature. Uh, Dr. Billington also created the, the World National Digital Library. It itself is a unique website that offers materials from around the world on one site in seven languages. He also spearheaded something I've already mentioned, our, the library's highly successful National Book Festival which will be 12 years old this September 22nd and 23rd are our dates. And from the start, Dr. Billington and I thank him for being an ardent supporter, not just of the Center for the Book and the National Ambassador Program, but also of reading for young people, 
and he also is the driving force behind the creation of something else I had to mention, the Young Readers Center. For all of these reasons, I'd like you to welcome the Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington. Dr. Billington. Thank you very, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, John. And um, um, I, I do want to say a word of, of welcome and thanks again to Robin Adelson for um, all she does uh, for this program. And I have to say a word about uh, John Cole, because in a way he's been an ambassador to the whole enterprise uh, of reading and of the book over many, many years, and uh, before I introduce our next ambassador, I just want you to all join me in a vote of thanks to John Cole. <laughs> now today really is a very special day, having three ambassadors uh, with us. Um, our current national ambassador for young people's literature, Catherine Patterson, has had a platform during her ambassadorship called Read for Your Life. You've already heard that, but it, it's a beautiful phrase that you can't repeat too often. And it's a message she'd been preaching long before she became our ambassador. And I think you can tell from her exposition that uh, she's not just a, a preacher in the, in the austere sense of the word, but a wonderful ambassadorial one who's had a great time and done wonderful things uh, during the past two years, uh, she's as internationally recognized as a writer. She's traveled the nation, urging young people to discover great books, to be inspired by them. Um, her own books, such as The Bridge to Trevithia, uh, The Master Puppeteer, and The Flint Heart, introduce readers to other cultures and other ways of life, which is what books do generally. And that's well, one of the, the really fun things that you'll, you'll discover in your own adventure in reading. Catherine's works are enjoyed not just in the United States, but all over the world for their universality, their richness. Please, so I want to thank again this uh, remarkable Catherine Patterson for dedicating the past two years of her rich and productive life to this important ambassadorial program and her special mission. So Catherine, thank you. Once again. <laughs> now the first national ambassador, John Sheska, um, took on this new role in 2008 through 2009, and he did so by bringing to it his unique sense of humor and irreverence. <clears throat> um, I sort of thought when, uh, when I thought of his humor of wondering whether people get the point. And when uh, Robin produced a sword, I saw the lights shining in the point of the whole ambassadorial mission, which he anticipated with his light touch. So sorry, that's a complicated uh, play on words, which I improvised to my own misfortune. <clears throat> Anyhow, with such titles as uh, John's as a stinky cheese man and other fairly stupid tales, and the true story of the three little pigs. John has endeared himself to millions of readers with his wit and his whimsy and his unique presence. But behind, of course, this humor lies a very serious purpose, encouraging young people to read in, uh, in all its forms, not just books, but web pages, uh, comics, blogs, and his own website, Guys Read. So, Guys Read uh, addresses a deficiency that's particular to boys who actually don't spend as much time reading as uh, girls do and, is, um, and sometimes have trouble reading um, and uh, in many ways are getting worse at reading. So, Guys Read, remember, Don Cheska will be on your case. <laughs> um, it, he's, uh, the site addresses a deficiency, as we said. Um, the good news is that um, research also shows that boys will read if they are given reading that uh, interests them. So John, we thank you 
for giving us that kind of reading and helping us launch this new initiative with all the wisdom, the humor you brought to it uh, during its first years. Uh, you've helped guys read, and so we thank you as the first guy as well as the first ambassador. <laughs> And now, Walter Dean Myers has published more than 100 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Monster. Wow, that's an attractive title. The first, it was the first winner of the Michael L. Prince Award. It was also a National Book Award finalist and a Coretta Scott, Bing, a Scott King uh, honor book. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's also the recipient of the Margaret A. Edwards Award for Lifetime Achievement in Writing for Young Adults. Uh, and in 2009, he delivered the May Hill Arbutheran Bothano Honor Lecture, which is a distinction reserved for an individual who's made significant contributions to the field of children's literature. So he is, in short, among today's most honored as well as most read authors. Along with his many literary achievements, Walter brings a new perspective to the whole National Ambassador, Ambassador Program. Um, he's, a, he's a big guy. <laughs> he grew up in Harlem, came there from his native West Virginia after he was given away by his father when he was a small child. The man who raised him was illiterate, um, and his wife was a cleaning woman. And Walter learned to read by the age of five. Uh, he loved reading. And today he shares his dedication as to reading as well as his skill in writing and talking about reading uh, wherever he goes, schools, libraries, detention centers, anywhere that where there are young people who need to have and hear his platform theme as national ambassador, reading is not optional. It really isn't if you come to think about it, you can't even use a computer if you can't read the instructions and read what comes up um, on the screen. Reading is not optional. What a wonderful platform, Walter Dean Myers. So the five-time winner of the Coretta Scott King Award has graciously accepted our invitation to serve as National Ambassador through 2013. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this very distinguished and wonderful new Ambassador, Walter Dean Myers. I gotta read. Thank you. You know, I love John and I love uh, Catherine. Such great people to be uh, connected with in any way. They're, they're such wonderful people, wonderful writers and enthusiastic people. And I'm so honored to be part of this entire uh, program. Uh, reading is important to me. On a very dreary, rainy day, I was talking to um, several men, and we, we had been talking for 45 minutes, uh, an hour, and the conversation was going quite well. And a guy said to me, you know, Mr. Myers, deep inside, I think we are a lot alike. Uh, he played, he had played basketball, he played sax, I played basketball, played a little sax. Uh, we hung out in the streets in our young days. He says, I think we were a lot alike. I said, yeah, you know, I guess we are. But we are in a maximum security prison, <laughs> and, and I'm going home, bro. 
I'm going home. <laughs> I began to ask him um, some questions about um, what had happened, what circumstance got him there. And he told me, and uh, I, was, I was moved by his story. And on the way home, I said, you know, we did have similar backgrounds. We did have similar backgrounds. Uh, I was raised in a foster home. I left school uh, in my senior year. There were all those kinds of little slippery things. But what was the difference? What was the difference? Why didn't I go the way that he had gone? And then it came to me that I could read since I was five years old, and I could read well. I learned to read, I don't know exactly how, but I remember my mom reading true romance magazines to me when I was three and four. I could never get my bosom to heave. <laughs> no. <laughs> I couldn't do some of the things. I didn't understand uh, a lot of what she was reading, but I enjoyed being in our little Harlem kitchen, listening to her voice. And I looked forward to it all the time. And by the time I was five, I could read to her. And I could read to her, I could follow along. Barbara turned to him with upturned eyes and <laughs> No, no. <laughs> Not understanding a lot. But what I had, no matter what happened to me, I had the, op the ability to take advantage of every opportunity that came my way. When I needed employment, I could read and fill out the the applications, when I decided, decided to join the Army, I could pass the Army tests. Whatever came my way, I could read well enough to do it. I was getting fairly decent jobs, not based upon my academic background, because my ac academic background was at best uh, slippery. <laughs> slippery, but based upon my ability to read, and I read everything. I read my mom, well, we had a neighbor who said I should not read comic books. What was wrong with that woman? I don't know. <laughs> but the kid next door to me, used, he was rich. I, I, well, he was richer than me. And his mom bought him comic books all the time, and he would put them into the garbage. He would put the comic books into the garbage. I would take them, put them under my bed, so my mom wouldn't see me reading the comic books. It got to the point where and I had to get little blocks of wood to lift the bed. I had so many, <laughs> so many comic books. No. But I read comic books. I read everything. Uh, I loved reading. Reading did things for me when I was troubled, and I often was, when my stepmom uh, became involved in alcohol, and that was filling up my life, filling up my entire head with the, the anxiety. I could turn to books. I could turn to books. I could move myself away. This guy didn't read when I was talking to him in prison. He didn't read. No opportunity that came along could he accept. I could read. I go to juvenile prisons today, and in so many of these juvenile prisons, I'm listening to young people 
whose vocabulary is so bad who can't read. All right, so what is it that I want to do? I want to save the world first, <laughs> declare world peace, take my sword around, <laughs> rescuing fair maidens. <laughs> I'm big on uh, fair maidens. You know? <laughs> I shouldn't say that my wife has a sword. <laughs> <laughs> but there are two things I would like to do. I would like to begin the, not begin the discussion, because the discussions have already started with Catherine and with John and with hundreds of other people who love books. And there's a mountain of research, though, that says that by the time young people begin school at five, they are far, far behind. There are kids who start school with a vocabulary of 3,000 words, and other kids who begin with a, a vocabulary of 12,000 to 15,000 words. That's an enormous gap. That is an enormous gap. There are kids who hear 3,000, three to 4,000 words, different words every month, and other kids who hear 35,000, 40,000 words. What do we need to do? One thing I would like to, to do is to get people reading to babies, reading to kids six months, nine months, a year, Read to the children, and I think you can do that with mentors and with grandparents and cousins and unemployed people. That's one thing I want to do. And then, as John preaches, as John preaches, reading has to become cool for the boys. It has to become cool. It has to be something that young people look at and say, I can do this. I can do it. There's something going on in some of the communities where when a young person gets to be 12 and 13 years old, they understand that reading is important. They know this. I ask everybody here, do you know this? And they'll all say, yes, we know that. But I'll also ask you, <laughs> do you know that exercise is important? You'll all say yes, too. <laughs> <All right. laughs> they know that, but then they begin to rank themselves. They decide who's smart, who's not smart. And when you turn to the book, there's this tremendous anxiety that takes place, which further hampers reading. And what I would like to do is to somehow move away from that. And I think that we can do this just by starting the conversation, just by continuing the conversation that John has started and, and, and Catherine. There's a mountain of research, a mountain of research that identifies the vocabulary problems of very young kids, there's a mountain of research that says that kids begin school with this gap, and we need to bring that research into the classroom, into the classroom. We need to bring it into the community and have this, and we have precedent. We have a precedent. Now, what happened at the end of the Civil War that all these people who emigrated from slavery to freedom. All these people who are now new citizens in our country, they wanted to read, they understood the importance of reading, and by God, in churches, in, in, in homes, they learned, and they did well. I'm honored by this. I, 
I'm going to wear it proudly. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. A wonderful job, a wonderful beginning. And let me say that uh, the Children's Book Council and the Library of Congress and Center for the Book look forward very much to working with you as we have with the other ambassadors you know, to make this truly a nation of readers. And we're gonna start with books by Walter D. Myers. Thanks to HarperCollins, the publisher, and their generosity. Uh, we're about to undertake a military maneuver, military-like maneuver as our guests leave. Uh, the books are for the kids who are here today, and Walter will go with me as soon as I, as we're done, and sit at the table, and he'll be pleased if you'll pick one of the three books uh, to sign it for you uh, as you exit. And these books are adults, these books are for the kids, okay? <laughs> uh, and the three books are Monster, the aforementioned, uh, Walter Dean Myers and Ross Workman, Kick, and also an advanced, uncorrected proof, advanced copy of all the right stuff. And you'll be able to select one of those as you go out, and Walter will sign it for you. And uh, we wish to thank you for being here. We wish to thank the audience for being here. Above all, we wish to thank Walter, John, Catherine, uh, for moving us in the right direction towards becoming a nation of readers. Let's give all of our ambassadors another round of applause. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.